Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Woo! <laughs> Welcome again to UNAX 2017 conference. This is our opening plenary session. Thank you all for waking up early, for coming here with uh, minds full of ideas and uh, plans and everything that we're here today to build a more united, stronger, and more effective anti-war movement. Uh, we just have a few opening remarks, and we'll get started with our uh, wonderful panel for this morning. I, I think Judy's going to roll us off into the morning. So welcome, everyone, to uh, UNIX Conference for 2017, Stop the Wars at Home and Abroad. We really need to build a movement, or we are uh, really watching a, an opportunity go by. So. Uh, I'm happy to see you here, and uh, we've worked hard to make this happen, and I personally love you all, so thank you for coming. So I'm going to go ahead and share our first part of the panel on international issues, which will uh, be on Africa. My name is Alison Bodine. I'm an anti-war and social justice activist and organizer in Vancouver, Canada, originally from the United States. I am the chair of Mobilization Against War and Occupation and on the editorial board of the Fire This Time newspaper, as well as coordinator of the Fire This Time Venezuela Solidarity Campaign. It is my honor and pleasure to be with you all this morning and to chair this panel. Uh, very grateful to all of our speakers. And uh, we'll have a few announcements uh, before we go into workshops, but I just want to remind people that we're here this morning for the educational aspect of the conference. There's not going to be a discussion afterwards, and I ask people not to try and start a discussion in the middle. <laughs> we're here to listen to our speakers, to learn, and then we can take those ideas to the workshops that are starting right after this panel begins. So uh, let's take notes and uh, get going. Our first speaker of this morning, speaking on the Congo and Central Africa, is Maurice Carney. Maurice is the executive director and co-founder of Friends of the Congo. Please join me in welcoming Maurice. Yeah, if you'd like to podium or sit, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you uh, today at the UNITE Conference. I'd uh, really like to thank um, Phil and the team for inviting us and including the topic of the, the Congo uh, in particular and, of course, uh, Africa in general. The, um, the theme is uh, Stop the War at Home and Abroad. And the African continent has been uh, the victim of two types of wars. One is uh, uh, proxy wars, where the United States uh, has uh, so-called allies or vassal states that it provides arms and financing and training, equipment to. And uh, when they commit heinous crimes on the African continent, then the US quickly unleashes its soft power and runs interference and provide diplomatic and political cover uh, for these war criminals on the African continent. The second type of war is covert wars. And on, up until 1960 or so, uh, according to a recently released uh, declassified documents of the State Department, the largest covert war in terms of financing in the world uh, in the 1960s was in the Congo, the recently independent Congo has gotten its independence from Belgium. And there's a reason why the United States had invested um, so much in that particular country. You see, the Congo is really the fulcrum on which the African continent swings. When the European nations established their spheres of influence on the African continent, 1884, 1885 in the Berlin Conference, which they also call the Congo Conference, Congo was central to the dismemberment of the African continent. And why is this? Because the Congo is literally and figuratively the heart of Africa. It straddles the equator. It's the size of Western Europe. It is arguably the richest piece of 
real estate on the planet. Mm -hmm. strategic, uh, strategic minerals come from the Congo, mm -hmm. where, for example, you have cobalt. Congo is the largest producer of cobalt, which is vital to aerospace industries. Batteries in your cell phones. Uh, if you have uh, Tesla, the batteries that are used in electric cars, you name it, cobalt is a key strategic mineral. Coltan, vital to the functioning of your electronic devices, your cell phones, your laptops. Uh, one U.S. Senator says every American has at least uh, one uh, device in which coltan, that they use in which coltan is found. So it is a critical country for the future of the African continent. And when the United States intervened in the Congo in 1960s, the chief of station of uh, the CIA, Larry Devlin, and he wrote a book uh, entitled Chief of Station Congo. I highly recommend that you consult it. He said that we had to intervene in the Congo because if we did not overthrow Lumumba, not only would we have lost Congo, but we'd have lost all of Africa. So he establishes the centrality and the significance of Congo to keeping the African continent dependent, keeping the African continent impoverished. And only did the United States and the CIA overthrow Patrice Emery Lumumba, but they also overthrow the democratic institutions and the dem those who were established the nascent uh, democratic processes in the country. So today when we hear that uh, the United States is concerned about interference in its elections and the people are distraught, <laughs> uh, we can only think of the interference that has been run by the U.S. in the Congo or Iran or Guatemala <laughs> or Chile. And I would submit that no country in the world has suffered as a to the degree that the Congo has suffered as a result of U.S. interference in its electoral process and its overthrow and subsequent assassination of Congo's first democratically elected leader and its independence hero. Because not only the United States overthrow the democratic institutions, this declassified document published by the U.S. State Department said that for the next decade, every leader that rose to power in the Congo did so at the behest of the CIA. In fact, there is no leader from the 1960s since Lumumba who has risen to power in the Congo without the backing of the United States. And there's no more notorious one than Joseph Desiree Mobutu, who the United States installed on the Congolese people for over three decades. A dictatorship that was installed and maintained by the United States. And when they got ready to get rid of Mobutu, the greatest democracy in the world, did not support the pro-democracy forces in the Congo. What they did was they provide arms and training and financing to Congo's neighbors and backed an invasion of the Congo by supporting Rwanda, the government of Rwanda and Paul Kagame, and the government of Uganda, Yara Museveni, who invaded the Congo and unleashed the deadliest conflict in the world since World War II, where an estimated six million people have lost their lives since 1996 but we hardly know about it. And when we, when we do hear about it, we put it in a context, in this ativism or this uh, tribal context, without looking at the underpin underpinning geostrategic uh, intrigue that facilitates the destabilizing, the murdering, the raping, the pillaging of the heart of the African continent. So when you look at Africa, and Congo in particular, you cannot talk about the situation in the Congo without talking about U.S. foreign policy. You cannot talk about the situation in the Congo without talking about the role that the United, Spla United States has played in destroying the country, in destabilizing the region. So therefore, each and every one of us has a responsibility to challenge U.S. foreign policy and its role on the African continent. I'm going to do a little survey, just a, just a general survey for you, just to give you a sense, uh, or to get a sense of uh, how you look at uh, African relations. How many of you have heard the term um, super predator? Raise your hand. Raise them real high. Okay. And who do you associate it with? Who do you associate it with? 
Hillary Clinton to the United States, right? I'd like for you to raise your hand um, if you've heard this phrase. Um, I came, I saw, and he died. Raise your hand real high. <laughs> Who do you associate that with? Hillary Clinton. So it's the same perspective, right? In one hand, you're talking about the militarization and the demonization of folks' black bodies here in the United States. And on the other hand, you're talking about the role that the United States is played in destroying a country called Libya and the assassination regime change that it undertook on the African continent. So the same mentality, same perspective, just applied in different parts of the world. So when we talk about Africa, we're not talking about something over there, especially when it comes to US foreign policy. We're talking about something that's right here. So I'll leave you with this message that for when we look at the situation on the African continent, I, be, um, I appeal to you not to look at it in a reductionist, narrow fashion, but to see it as a part of the same politics that are taking place here. The politics of uh, destruction, politics where you prioritize uh, profit over the people, a politics where you, uh, where the United States, in particular, hold up dictatorships, hold up um, sociopaths, and provide them with diplomatic and political cover and present them to you as if they're the future leaders or the Renaissance leaders of the African continent. So I encourage you to join us as we appeal to you to challenge U.S. foreign policy, to look at the African continent, what transpires on the African continent, just the same way you would bring the same intellectual uh, faculties to bear on your local situation here in the United States. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maurice. Our next speaker is Lee Robinson. Lee is a political organizer, pan-Africanist, and member of the All-African People's Revolutionary Party, GC, a videographer and media personality. He is founder, host, and producer of African on the Move on Blog Talk Radio and African Speaks, which can be viewed on Comcast Cablevision within the Richmond metro area. Please join me in welcoming Lee. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. Good morning. Good morning. As the organizer for the All African People's Revolutionary Party, GC, we're going to talk just a little, uh, reflect just a little bit about history. We're going down history a little bit. Good, because history is a continuance. We are part of the history, the past, the present. We're also going to be a part of the future in terms of our actions and behavior. One of the things that human beings that we must remember is that Things we do as human beings can always impact those who come after us. So we must always be conscious of our actions and activities. As a continuance over 133 years ago, in 1884-85, a conference called the Berlin Conference set in motion an organized scramble for Africa. The issue then and now was who will own and control Africa and African people. Following close to this conference, European powers expanded their claim in Africa such that by 1990, European states had claimed 90% of African territories. We see this struggle and its history continue to play out itself today from a political, economical, social, and cultural domination to now military domination. This military domination can be seen through the creation of AFRICON. We said no to AFRICON. The United States Africa Man, which is under the Secretary of Defense, were imposed by U.S. imperialism on Africa and African masses on October 1, 2007, and became an independent command in October 1, 2008. U.S. AFRICOM represents an intensification, a less an elevation of repression, oppression, exploitation, 
by U.S. imperialism and African anti-people against legitimate interests of our people in Africa. U.S. Africa operates in all Africa infringements on the dignity and sovereignty of African states and people, and it is crystal clear for the defense of neocolonialism. U.S. Af Africa role in Africa is to ensure that the free flow of African natural minerals and human resources continue to fill the coffers of the United States and Western Europe and to crush any and all revolutionary aspirations of the African masses. The oversight for this U.S. government military operation against Africa is through U.S. Special Operations Command in Africa. It's well organized and financed to conduct imperialist military operations against the masses of Africa and African people in every corner of Africa and the world. We also know that U.S. Africa now holds its headquarters on a secret base in Morocco. It is a U.S. imperialist military obstacle to what is needed in order for a United Africa, Kwame Nkrumah stated, it's clearly in 1966 what's what needed for Africa. His analysis was correct then and remains so today. Africa will be liberated sooner or later against all odds. But it, if it is to be soon by an accelerated revolution of the people and a total war against imperialism, then we must establish a unified continental high command here and now to plan revolutionary war and to initiate action. If we fail to do this, and to lead the people revolution, we are likely to be swept away one by one in pillism and neocolonialism. It is no longer feasible to take a middle course. The time for reform, however progressive, is past. For reforms cannot hold the enemy at bay, nor they convince the silence internal agents of neocolonialism, eliminate the puppets, or even destroy the capitalist structure and mentality inherited from colonialism. This is exactly what happened. It is what we see in 2017. Neocolonialism is the dominant form of exploitation in Africa and the African world today. Neocolonialism is the resort of the mass struggle for independence and the purest compromise to the demand for independence and sham independence. Not genuine, genuine independence, sham independence. The masses of African people, those in Africa and those abroad, are powerless as powerful rests in the hands of a elite African minority, the anti people. We'd like to just remind you a few things about the reality when we talk about Africa and its exploitation by the West and the rest of the world. How the world profit from Africa wealth? Recently, there was a report done in 2017, and this only covers just the sub saharan on down section of African countries. It stated that $162 billion goes in Africa, $41 billion are extracted each year, but $203 billion goes out of Africa. We, f we find that countries of Africa are collectively net creditors to the rest of the world to the tune of $41.3 billion in 2015. That's much more as wealth than leaving the world most impoverished continent than its entity. Africa countries receive $161.6 billion in 2015, million loans, personal remittances, and aid in the form of grants. Yet, two hundred three billions were taken from Africa, either directly, mainly through corporations, repatriating profits, and illegally moving money out of the continent, or by costs imposed by the rest of the world through climate changes. Five percent of the world population, the U.S. consumes 25 percent of the world production of oil. It receives 18 percent of the oil directly from Africa 
and seeks to increase it to 25%, 25% in the next few years. This is why we said no to AFRICOM. We know AFRICOM's major reason for being in Africa is to maintain its access to oil, to mineral, as well as to human domination. We said no. For Africa to progress, the United States of America and NATO must begin to, must be expelled for Africa. They must be expelled for Africa. And the only way, and the best way we can do this, is when Kuma taught us, there must be a, a call and a building for all African people revolutionary party, the formation of a political party linking all liberated territories and struggling parties on a common ideology will smooth the way for eventual continental unity and we at the same time greatly assist the persecution of the all African people's wall committee for political control and coordination should be established to act as a liaison between all parties which recognize the urgent necessity of conducting an organized, unified, unified struggle against capitalism, liberalism, neocolonialism, and imperialism. This is why we come to ask all countries, brothers and sisters, of Africa and African descent, to come join and help build an all African people Russian European party. We said come and build the AAPIPGC. This will give the solution to our people, also will make an advancement for all of humanity. A free, unified Africa will free and help a free all of humanity. We come and thank you. We thank you. This is our task today. We thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Lee. So to close off the Africa section of the panel this morning, I want to invite Mekdes Wainechet, uh, who is here as a Movement for Black Lives activist, a writer and a mom who lives in Maryland. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming you. Yeah, yeah, feel free. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I think this is a very important conference to be having. Um, we need to be talking about war because, you know, just last year, the United States, which most Americans don't even know is engaged in war, dropped 27,000 bombs on the world. So this is a very important conference. So um, I'm going to be talking to you about famine as a weapon of war. And right now, um, in several different countries, in the, Lake, in the Lake Chad region, in the Bab el Mandeb region, in the Horn of Africa region, starvation is being used as a weapon of war. Um, the first country is Yemen. Um, it sits right on the ba Bab el Mandeb region. Um, and the Bab el Mandeb is a strategic point for global oil production and transport. 13% of the world's um, oil travels through. So that's a st strategic point for the United States. And um, rule by instability is, is the name of the game there. Um, they don't want a coherent government, a coherent socialist government um, taking power in that region and closing the ports off to them. So um, the first situation is Yemen, where um, a couple of years ago, the Houthis, a nationalist group um, who want freedom from US and Saudi neocolonialism, they took power. Um, the United States, um, Saudi, along with the United States and Britain, started bombing them. The bombing wasn't going out so well, so uh, about six months ago, they, they stopped food, food imports into the country. And the U.S. Navy is actually sitting in the ports, keeping food from going to the country, even though they know that every 10 minutes, a child is killed through forced starvation. Um, and if you see these videos, it is truly horrific. There are these little babies, skin and bones, starving to death. Um, 
So it just goes to show you, like, the people running our country are sociopaths, because they know that this is happening. And they continue. So they can protect their profits. So, yeah, right now in Yemen, every 10 minutes a child is dying. Food, food imports have stopped for several months, and it's a horrific situation. And this is going on right now. Um, and it's not a pretty thought, but throughout our conference, several children would have died just in that area from starvation. And that is like the most cruel torture for anyone, especially a child, to endure. And that all has to do with oil. So, yeah, so think about that. Um, and moving on to um, the Ogaden region, which is in southern Ethiopia and Somalia, they also share the Bab el Mendeb. They're also on the Bab el Mendeb. And the same thing is going on there. Um, it's all about keeping coherent governments um, taking power in that area. So right now in Somalia, you will see the same scenes. They are little children um, wasting away. Um, aid, food aid is being kept from the people. And in Ethiopia, um, the, the Ethiopian government continues to receive hundreds of millions of dollars from the United States as it continues to commit atrocities on the Ogaden people. And the Ogaden people in southern Ethiopia, they're ethnic Somalis. So ideally, they'd like to be autonomous or part of Somalia. But um, the Ethiopian government and its allies, like the US, do not want to lose any of that strategic land to Somalia. So when the Ethiopian army's um, campaign of mass murder and rape hasn't worked, they have been starving the people. This is also going on right now. And the US government is also um, connected to that right now. So we've already talked about two places where people are being forcefully starved to death. And the hardest hit are children under five. So. And moving on, we go to the Lake Chad region, northeastern Nigeria. Um, and Nigeria is another oil hotspot, so all this mass starvation is related to oil. 20% of the United States oil comes from Nigeria, so it fuels, uh, it fuels our lives and you know, the US military. Um, and in Nigeria, 105 children every day are dying from forced starvation for 105, no, 184 young children under five are dying every single day, starving to death. And um, for the last few years, people in the northeastern region of Nigeria have experienced many attacks, attacks, their farms being burned to the ground, murder, rape, and you know, the uh, international media is going to tell you, oh, it's Boko Haram, which is a uh, terrorist groups. And you know we're all, we know all about the terrorist groups. But people who have survived the attacks, they say it's the Nigerian military. So the Nigerian military that's, uh, you know, receives millions from the United States. And the United States has huge interests in that area. So, you know, we can connect the dots. So you see in all these countries, um, you know, like these horrific crimes are being committed. You know, we hear about crimes that have happened in the past and we're like, you know, let's say for example, one that we hear about a lot is the Holocaust in Germany, in Nazi Germany. And we're like, oh, that is so horrific and it's, it's just unthinkable. But that's happening right now. And our government that we pay taxes to, um, you know, is, is doing this on our behalf. And it is on our behalf because there is not a big enough resistance to stop it right now. So, you know, we will have blood on our hands unless we organize to the point that we can actually stop this. Um, so, and, you know, both Nigeria and, both Nigeria and um, Ethiopia are part of Africa, U.S. Africa Command, and that is, the, that is an arm of the United States military. And it is there explicitly to um, 
secure capitalist interests. So, and one of AFRICOM's first mission was to destroy Libya, which was an independent socialist nation. So that, and you know, in Libya, nobody was hungry. Housing was a human right. Healthcare was free. Education was free. Um, everyone had access to food and clean water. Women had lengthy, lengthy maternity leaves. Um, so this is, and so like, if we think about it, the fight against war is a fight against capitalism. And the fight, thank you. Yes. And the fight for peace is a fight for socialism. Because we see the kind of, thank you. Because <laughs> we see the conditions in, you know, in socialist nations. How many countries has Cuba bombed? How many countries did Libya bomb? How many countries did Eritrea bomb? Yeah, and they make sure their people have access to what is necessary for life. So, you know, when we think about how do we resist this war that, you know, we feel is outside of our control, I think we need to think about, we need to be thinking about pushing towards socialism. We need to be, we need to be able to pull off a general strike because a general strike is the only form of gun-free resistance that, will get, that can get your, um, our demands met. In Buenaventura, Colombia right now, they, um, yeah, they shut down their city for 22 days. And the teacher's on a, gen on a strike right now. So I think in the United States, um, we really have a lot of waking up to do. We have a lot of worker empowering to do because even as capitalism oppresses us, workers run every aspect of capitalism. So we are actually the ones who have the power to shut it down. So, yes, yes. Thank you. So I just have one closing remark. Okay. Um, which I now kind of forgot, but. Um, so I think, cause you know, we've marched, there are millions of people marched against the Iraq war, but the capitalists, the warmongers, they kept marching on and they didn't stop any wars. So we need, we need new strategies and we need to, you know, empower workers, empower ourselves, look for socialism, um, cause that's the only way we can stop it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mekbe, thank you. And to all of our panel uh, for the Africa section for starting us this morning as the first workshop, thank you very much. <laughs> we're going to keep going with the plenary session. Um, we're going to move to Asia. So I'd like every speaker that's uh, scheduled to speak in Asia to come up and sit here at the tables, if you could, please. I also wanted to uh, introduce our chair uh, who's going to lead us through the Asia section. This is Judy Bello, someone I'd only known over the phone until just this morning. She is a founding member of the Upstate Coalition to Ground the Drones and In the Wars and a member of UNAC's Administrative Committee. She has spent time in jail for civic resistance actions, visited drone strike victims in Pakistan, and traveled with peace delegations to Iran, Kurdish Iraq, and Syria. Judy belongs or blogs at deconstructedglobe.com and administers the website upstatedroneaction.org, as well as built the base for the UNAC conference website. So uh, thank you, Judy, and let's go into the next section. Thank you very much, Allison. Uh, I'm really excited to see you all here. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, and it's really important work. Uh, I'm here to introduce the uh, speakers on Asia, so I'm going to get right with the program here. The first speaker you will hear from is Hyun Lee. Hyun is the managing editor of Zoom in Korea, an online resource on peace and democracy on the Korean Peninsula. She's also on the steering committee of the task force to stop bad in Korea and militarism in Asia and the Pacific. So let's welcome Hyun. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to uh, speak to you today. Um, such a, a highly conscious group of people with a wealth of experience and involved in so many important struggles 
uh, around the country and around the world. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm going to talk about the root of the U.S. North Korea crisis and a path uh, for peace in Korea. So uh, just to um, lay out some basic historical facts uh, that are important to know to understand what's at the root of the current tension. Um, first of all, the United States and North Korea have been in a state of war for the past 65 years. So what we're seeing today is nothing new. Uh, it was at the end of the Korean War in 1953 uh, there was an armistice that was signed, which is a temporary ceasefire, not a permanent peace treaty. And the signatories to that armistice were the DPRK and the United States, not South Korea. Um, and in the text of that agreement, it said within three months of signing this agreement, there should be a conference to settle this conflict permanently and discuss the withdrawal of all foreign troops. China did withdraw its troops, but that conference never happened. The US uh, still keeps 28,500 troops since then in South Korea. Um, also, the South Korean military is under the command of US generals. Um, the United States has wartime operational control, which means that if a war should break out in Korea, it's the United States that commands South Korean troops. Um, the second point to note is that the US has always maintained a threat of a nuclear preemptive strike. Uh, against North Korea. Uh, it had hundreds of nuclear weapons in the South between 1958 to 1991, and its war plan against North Korea includes the use of nuclear weapons preemptively. Um, it also routinely uh, exercises the collapse of the North Korean regime. So uh, what's important for us to know is that this, this ongoing war on the Korean Peninsula is not between the North and the South as many in the US like to say, especially the corporate media, it's between North Korea and the United States. Now, on the question of North Korea's nukes, um, since the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, North Korea faced an existential crisis, both in terms of energy, because its fuel imports were suddenly cut off, um, but also the U.S. was um, exercising uh, regime collapse scenarios right uh, at its border. So North Korea turned to develop nuclear weapons, both for energy purposes and as a deterrent against an attack. Um, why nukes as a deterrent? Uh, well, simply because the North Korea is such a small country and poor and it cannot compete with the United States when it comes to conventional weapons. Nuclear weapon is the most economical and the most effective form of deterrent. North Korea has repeatedly offered to freeze its nuclear weapons development in exchange for an assurance from the United States that it will not attack um, so there were many agreements in the past, most notably in 1994, the agreed framework, where North Korea actually did freeze its nuclear weapons development. Um, however, the U.S. did not uh, follow through on its end of the bargain um, because the conventional wisdom in Washington was that uh, North Korea will soon collapse, and so the United States did not need to follow up on its commitments. Um, and then, of course, the previous administration um, practiced a policy called strategic patience, which meant no engagement at all. Um, and why is North Korea now a top priority for the United States? Um, as long as the United States was not engaging with North Korea for the past eight years, North Korea just kept on uh, developing its nuclear weapons. And now many experts say it is uh, close to uh, having an intercontinental ballistic missile that may be able to reach the continental United States uh, with a nuclear warhead. Um, this is why Washington is so worried about North Korea right now, and this is what they're trying to stop. Not because they think that North Korea will actually launch an ICBM towards the United States, but more because if, the United, if North Korea has a full nuclear arsenal and an ICBM, uh, it changes the U.S. strategic calculus in the region. It means that it's dealing with another nuclear power that is not an ally. Um, also, it, it challenges the nuclear non-proliferation regime. There is a double standard in uh, the U.S. Uh, stance towards North Korea because while it condemns North Korea for its missile tests, 
The United States continuously tests ballistic missiles uh, in California, the Minuteman III. After 20 years of engaging in negotiations that have gotten them nowhere, North Korea has now said denuclearization is not part of, uh, is not on the table for negotiations. Uh, it held its historic seventh party Congress last year, and it is basically now written into the national constitution that it is a nuclear power. So at this point, Trump has very limited options. Uh, first of all, military action is too costly and dangerous, even from a U.S. strategic point of view. Um, in the 1990s, President Clinton considered a military strike against North Korea, and ultimately they nixed the idea because the Pentagon came back after doing some simulations with an assessment that even limited action would quickly uh, escalate into a full-scale war, a drawn-out war, and lead to the death of one million people within the first 24 hours. Uh, intelligence experts now are saying the U.S. intelligence is very limited uh, on uh, the location of North Korea's nuclear program. The only way to guarantee the complete removal of the so-called North Korea threat is the use of nuclear weapons or the invasion and occupation of North Korea. So, the, so that risks a drawn-out regional conflict that would include Japan, that would include China, that would be very dis destabilizing, uh, not only to the region, but the global economy. So for the United States, uh, this is not a viable option. And for now, it seems to be off the table. So the Trump administration's policy right now is called maximum pressure and engagement. This is basically intensifying section, sanctions, uh, continuing uh, military exercises, and it is trying to force North Korea uh, to capitulate uh, before getting to the negotiating table. But the problem with this is that this, is, this is, has been tried before um, and have not worked. Um, as long as negotiations are based on denuclearization as the goal, uh, it's not going to work uh, because North Korea has already said that is off the table. Right now, the only sensible path that many, even in Washington, are calling for is a freeze of uh, nuclear's current nuclear weapon, uh, North Korea's nuclear weapons program uh, in exchange for the United States ending its war games, uh, abandoning, abandoning its U.S. nuclear first uh, strike prerogative, and also reaching a fundamental resolution to the ongoing conflict by signing a peace treaty uh, that brings closure to the Korean War, and then finally withdrawing U.S. troops uh, from the Korean Peninsula. I just, I just want to end with one last point, which is that I have had many discussions with progressives in the United States that characterize North Korea as a belligerent for testing missiles and having nuclear weapons. Um, but, you know, Brother Ajamu said last night very articulately that we stand for peace, but not without justice. And I, I agree with him wholeheartedly that we cannot talk about peace if the notion of peace is based on another people's subjugation. Um, you know, I, I pose the question, uh, if North Korea stopped testing missiles and gave up its nuclear weapons, does that truly mean peace? For the North Korean people, they have lived under U.S. sanctions for almost seven decades and the constant fear of a U.S. military attack. And for North Korea, justice would mean decolonization of the Korean Peninsula and the right to sovereignty. After 20 years of negotiating with Americans, it seems that North Korea has come to the conclusion that the only thing that the United States responds to is might. And that the only reason it hasn't gone down the route of Libya or Iraq is because it has nuclear weapons. And so what the question that I would like to pose as I end my presentation is what would it actually take for us to create the conditions so that North Korea does not have to resort to missile tests and nuclear weapons to defend its sovereignty? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Bruce Gagnon. Uh, he was trained by the United Farm Workers Union as an organizer of fruit pickers in Florida. Bruce, whoops, excuse me. Bruce coordinates the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. 
He lives in Bath, Maine. Bruce is also a Vietnam War era vet and a member of Veterans for Peace. Today, Bruce is going to talk about the TAD military deployment in South Korea. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with all of you. I feel like it's family. The global network this year is 25 years old. We were created to stop the arms race in space. Everything the Pentagon does today militarily is coordinated and directed by space technology. The United States wants regime change in Russia and China, fundamental. NATO today is expanding, breaking promises that were made at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union that, that NATO would not expand towards Russia. Today, NATO is on steroids, moving right up to the Russian border. And now NATO is even going global, becoming a global military alliance, creating partnerships in the Asia Pacific with Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore. One of the key space technologies being used today is so-called missile defense, which is actually a key element in US Pentagon first strike attack planning. The idea is that missile defense would serve as the shield after a US first strike attack. U.S. launches an attack, something that the Space Command annually war games. U.S. launches a first strike attack on Russia and China in that war game. And then when they try to fire their remaining retaliatory capability, so-called missile defense shield is used to pick off their retaliatory strikes, giving the U.S. a quote-unquote successful first strike attack. Missile defense used to be illegal under the U.S.-Russia ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, that George Bush withdrew the U.S. from soon after he became president. And so today the U.S. is deploying missile defense on the land and at sea all over the world. Just this past year, under the Obama administration, U.S. deployed missile defense ground-based launching system in Romania, and this year it's going into Poland. At the same time, Navy Aegis destroyers made in my hometown of Bath, Maine, are, have been outfitted with missile defense systems, and they're being used to move into the Black Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Baltic Sea, soon to go into the Barents and the Bering Seas surrounding Russia. At the same time, the U.S. is deploying missile defense systems in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Guam, Hawaii, and again on U.S. Navy Aegis destroyers encircling the coastal regions of China. In recent months, the Pentagon has begun deploying THAAD, T-H-A-A-D, THAAD, a missile defense system. THAAD stands for Theater High Altitude Area Defense, and this is now going into a melon farming community called Songju in South Korea. The people have been protesting day and night for the past year in Songju against this THAAD deployment. You might have heard that recently the Korean government, the right-wing puppet government, in Seoul was collapsed, was the uh, President Park was uh, impeached. Uh, and that was largely because the people of Korea by the millions repeatedly went into the streets protesting against President Park, a U.S. puppet. But right before the impeachment, the United States rushed in the THAAD deployments into Songju so that the new progressive President Moon has this challenge. Do I stand up to the United States and tell them to pull the THAAD missile defense deployment out soon after I got elected? And so he's in a real bind now. But he has announced that he wants an immediate environmental impact statement done, something that will delay further deployments. 
but the ones that have already been deployed so far, it looks like they will remain. The Chinese and the Russians are very upset about THAAD deployment in Songju because the radar has an ability to see well beyond Korea all the way into Russia and China. And they believe that this system is not really aimed at North Korea, but in fact is aimed at, again, Russia and China. Some years ago, I read in one of the space industry publications about a North Korean launch. And the American military personnel that were in charge of tracking that launch were laughing at it, making fun of North Korea, saying, you know, they don't even have the space assets, the space technology to follow their own missile. They can't even track it. So in fact, North Korea is not a real challenge to the United States. It's a show being used to excuse the U.S. further militarization of the Asia-Pacific region, again being aimed at Russia and China. So this is the reality uh, today. Uh, the Global Network, every October, organizes something we call Keep Space for Peace Week. This year it will be October 7th through the 14th, an international week of local protest against the militarization of space. This year our theme is no missile defense in Korea, no THAAD in Songju, and this poster is in the uh, literature room. I hope you'll pick one up and help us inform people about what is really behind THAAD and missile defense uh, by the United States. So help us spread the word, help us keep this going, this resistance to U.S. space technology global domination program. Our job is to stand in solidarity with people at home and people around the world who are fighting against this notion of U.S. global domination. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Our next speaker is Raymond Mong Palatino. He is a former legislator with the Philippine House of Representatives, an activist, a political analyst, and a columnist and chairperson of the Metro Manila chapter of Bayan Philippines. So let's welcome uh, Raymond, and he's going to speak is going to speak about uh, the struggle against U.S. war and intervention in the Philippines, which is definitely ongoing. Thanks. Magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. Good morning, everyone. Mabuhay. Okay. Or should I say good evening? <laughs> because it's already past 10 p.m. in the Philippines. I'd like to share two narratives today. First, the narrative of colonialism and or neocolonialism. And second, which I think is more important for this occasion, the narrative of resistance. Specifically, the century struggle of the Filipino people to defeat U.S. imperialism. Let me say that once again. U.S. imperialism. For me, to say U.S. imperialism inside the U.S., in front of many people, this alone would make my trip very meaningful. <laughs> but let me first talk about the various ways in, way, in which the U.S. have justified its militarist intervention in the Philippines. In 1898, the U.S. arrived in the Philippines to liberate us from Spanish colonialism. But we have already defeated the Spanish army. Yes. And we have just established Asia's first republic. President McKinley said America will Christianize Filipinos, forgetting that we are already Catholics. <laughs> in fact, we are the only Catholic-dominated nation in Asia today, aside from Timor. Indeed, America established a public education system, 
but one of its legacy is to brainwash Filipinos about the supposedly noble motives of Big Brother America. America, according to our educators, American educators, is in the Philippines to teach Filipinos about democracy, and it's not really interested with our forests, gold mines, not to mention a market to dump its surplus products, or the control of a strategic sea route to access the Asia-Pacific market. We are so grateful to America that after World War II, when we gained our token independence, we gave American investors the same rights with Filipinos, the freedom to plunder our natural resources, and to show our hospitality to the Americans, we extended the lease to Subic and Clark military bases. Clark, in the 20th century, was the biggest American base outside the US. What you call military industrial complex here meant military entertainment, entertainment industry in Subic and Clark, the emergence of a military entertainment industry. In between wars, especially during the Vietnam War, US troops will stay in the Philippines for quote and unquote rest and recreation. The US military expressed its gratitude by leaving a legacy of toxic waste in these bases. In the 1970s, a dictatorship regime emerged in the Philippines. The US supported this government. In fact, the US has been instrumental in shaping the electoral results and political events in our country after World War II. During the Bush years, the Philippines was made a second front in the war on terror after Iraq and Afghanistan. It meant the arrival of troops conducting military exercises on our lands. In 2014, in implementation of the Asia pivot, our government signed a new deal with the Obama government, which meant the building of U.S. facilities across the Philippines. The U.S. said these facilities, plus the increased deployment of troops, will benefit the Philippines because this will provide a quicker and easier access for the disaster relief efforts of the U.S. military every time a typhoon, earthquake, or other calamities will cause destruction in our country. Again, the narrative of neocolonialism disguised as a humanitarian endeavor. But there's another narrative I like to emphasize. The narrative of the struggle for national liberation. The Philippine-American War from 1898 to 1902, the nationalist movement during the early years of the 20th century, the peasant uprisings in the 1930s, the People's Army during World War II, the rise of the Communist Hook Rebellion in the 1940s and 50s, the National Democratic Movement in the 1960s, the anti-dictatorship struggle in the 1980s, the people power in 1986, and the anti-basis movement which led to the expulsion of American military bases in 1991. Every time the media is reporting about 9-11, I think about 9-16, September 16, 1991, the day when Filipinos kick out the U.S. bases from our lands. The struggle is not yet over because U.S. troops are still conducting military games on our lands, American facilities are now being constructed because of the Asia pivot and the New Deal in 2014. And right now, the U.S. is mysteriously undertaking anti-terror, anti-ISIS activities in Mindanao. Meanwhile, a war is raging in our homeland. There is a vibrant mass movement resisting U.S. military intervention. It is aware that the U.S. government, the U.S. war machine, is supporting the local reactionary forces that violently suppress the people's clamor for land, decent wages, clean environment, and a democratic government. The forces of oppression appear powerful today, but, but I think there's no time to despair, no reason to surrender. This is my first UNAC, and I would like to say that I was inspired by the presentations last night and earlier today. And when I go back to the Philippines, I will tell my comrades that there's less reason to be worried about Trump. Because right here in America, there are groups like UNAC, peace-loving activists like you, 
who are bravely challenging the U.S. military machine. And I'm saying that, I would like to say that I'm optimistic about our work because how can imperialism win if the grassroots all over the world, in Asia, Africa, and right here in America, are uniting to resist militarism, racism, and oppression. Imperialismo, ibagsak. Thank you, Mong. Our next speaker is uh, Brian Becker. Brian is the executive director of the Answer Coalition. He's a founder of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. He's currently the show host of a daily one-hour show and podcast called Loud and Clear for Radio Sputnik. Imperialism in the 21st Century is his latest book. He's going to speak to us today on uh, the U.S. pivot to Asia, U.S. relations with China and the DPRK. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. That's a big topic for eight minutes, yeah. which we won't, we won't do. Last week, about 10 days ago, the U.S. carried out a nuclear bomb dropping drill just offshore in North Korea. Probably didn't hear about that in the media. Not considered a provocation. Not considered a provocation. Taking place during the so-called war games, the war exercises that are carried out twice a year, simulating by the United States in concert with South Korean military the destruction of North Korea. North Korea sent off an intermediate range nuclear, a uh, not nuclear missile test at the same time. That became the subject for a UN Security Council deliberation, adding on additional sanctions on North Korea. So the United States can engage in, a sim in the simulated nuclear bomb dropping drill on North Korea and simulate the destruction of North Korea and that's never a provocation. The demonization of North Korea when it takes any measure to defend its country has to be understood by us, by us in the anti-war movement for what it is. Whenever the oppressed, whenever those who are targeted or victimized by imperialism attempt to defend themselves, they are labeled as provocateurs or terrorists. Every time Palestinian children pick up a rock and try to fight back against occupation, they are painted as terrorists. Whenever anybody tries to fight back against the nonstop Israeli aggression carried out in Lebanon or Gaza or against Palestinian and Arab peoples throughout the Middle East, characterized as terrorists. The US left has gone along with the demonization campaigns organized by imperialisms, which has fundamentally disarmed the movement at the most important times. We have to reject that kind of demonization directed against the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. When they carry out war exercises, war games, it cannot be considered a game or funny to the people of North Korea. The, the Encyclopedia Britannica in 1967 said about the Korean War that began June 25th, 1950 and ended July 27th, 1953, at least with an armistice that four to five million Koreans died. Four to five million Koreans died. The main complaint, the fundamental and primary complaint of US air pilots was that there was nothing left to bomb in North Korea because there was not one structure taller than one story still standing by the end of 1950 and the bombing continued for another two years. The use of white phosphorus in napalm all kinds of weapons of mass destruction directed against the DPRK, and yet we have people in the so-called US liberal peace movement echoing the same demonizing, colorful demonizing rhetoric against the, People's Re uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea when it stands up, when it says, you know what, we're not going to be subjected once again. The only reason that North Korea, unlike Libya and unlike Iraq, has not been invaded, has not been the subject of occupation and, and aerial bombing, is because the DPRK has remained intact 
and has pursued a policy whereby it has a military deterrent capable of inflicting great damage on the imperialists and on their allies, and as a consequence, war has not come again to the Korean Peninsula. I mean, we must understand that protesting war is not simply a protesting the absence of peace, as others have said, and as someone quoted a Jammu from last night, it's not just about the absence about, of peace, it's the absence of justice. The leadership of the DPRK represents that part of the Korean nation that resisted Japanese imperialism and then continued to resist U.S. imperialism. While the South Korean government and its military, the architecture and the edifice that was created was nothing other than an extension by U.S. imperialism of the former Japanese proxy client forces that ruled over the Korean Peninsula on behalf of the Japanese imperialists. Why would the Korean people not embrace those in the Korean Peninsula who resisted rather than accommodate to imperialism and colonialism? It's not simply a matter of ideology or communism. It's a matter also of national independence and freedom and the right to be free from imperialism, the least democratic social system on the face of the planet or in the, face, or in the history of the planet's existence. This is not just the first Asia pivot as the other speakers spoke. I'm glad that the panel today starts with Asia and Africa. It was the pivot to Africa with the enslavement of African people and the pivot to Asia starting especially in the late 1880s that is the foundation of modern late stage capitalism. And we can't see the undoing of this kind of awful capitalist social economic order and its imperialism without recognizing that the liberation of Africa and the liberation of Asia will not be partly responsible but fundamental to the global task of the liberation of the planet from capitalism and imperialism. Right now, the uh, Democrats who are resisting Trump uh, stopped resisting when Trump in one week launched 59 cruise missiles against Syria and at the same time said he's sending the armada to Korea and the Trident submarines which he said were a great deal more dangerous than the aircraft carrier which in fact is true because they can simultaneously with one submarine destroy 24 North Korean cities instantly. That submarine, those Trident subs are there Again, part of the war exercises simulating the destruction of DPRK. We have to also recognize that part of the struggle against demonization, which is the struggle against racism, because racism and demonization are, conf are the intertangled toxic combinations that are fundamental to imper imperialist propaganda, that we have to build solidarity with the people of Korea. We have to build the solidarity with the people of Palestine and with the people in Venezuela and the people in Cuba. Instead of simply treating these countries, these targeted populations with racist and caricatured stereotypes, we have to build genuine people-to-people -people exchange. And I don't mean to become left-wing tourists of visiting revolutionary sites and immersing ourselves in the glory and drama of other yesteryear revolutionary struggles. I mean to go to Korea go to Cuba, go to Palestine, bring anti-imperialist uh, delegations, but with the idea that when we come back, we fight and fight and fight and resist the ruling class right here in the United States. Thank you.